I want to show you a little bit about pyroclastic materials and pyroclastic deposits. <clears throat> you see the, the ash cloud coming up in this um, eruption in the Philippines. This is Pinatubo. And it's these explosive materials that are ejected out of the volcano that, um, that we're dealing with when we talk about pyroclastic material. So here's some examples. Um, you've got ash, which are very fine particles. Those are less than um, two millimeters in diameter. So from extremely small to up to two millimeters. We have lapilli that are pea-sized particles that can be ejected out of a volcano, and those are between two and 64 millimeters. Um, and we have on the left bombs um, and blocks that I'll show you in the next image. But these are generally greater than 64 millimeters. And they can be quite large too. These are just some smaller examples. You can see the penny per scale. Bombs are uh, ejected when they're still partially molten and so they have this form that looks streamlined as they're flying through the air um, and before they crash to the ground they're cooling and crystallizing. Um, and all of these materials, you'll notice, are only classified based on their size, uh, the particle size. So these are individual particles that are ejected out of the volcano, and they're not consolidated into um, a rock. We'll look at some of those, but they, they are all rock, but they're not um, lithified from a bunch of different pieces of pyroclastic ejecta. Here's a, a block that is um, quite large. It's more than 64 millimeters, clearly. Um, these larger materials are those that um, aren't going to fly very far out of a volcano. Here's a cinder cone in Argentina, and you're just seeing the side of the cinder cone, but you'll see these blocks, and there are bombs in here too. You can't tell exactly from um, at this magnification, but there are some blocks that are falling quite close to the to the top of the cinder cone. If we turn around and look the other direction, it's really clear, this is standing on the side of the cinder cone, that these larger blocks aren't moving very far, aren't being ejected very far from the cinder cone. You'll see that the limit is somewhere right in here. And beyond that, it's much finer material because the heavy material falls out first. Um, be, and and the, the smaller material uh, uh, can be transported farther from the volcanic center. You can also have volcanic glasses. This is some obsidian just to remind you, but pumice certainly you can get in these pyroclastic ejecta. And recall that you saw some Pele tears and Pele's hair. Um, these are also volcanic glasses that are erupted and mildly explosive eruptions. Um, such that you see in Hawaii. Now, pyroclastic materials aren't classified the same way as I alluded to before. Um, I've shown you this IUGS diagram that uses the quartz alkali feldspar plagic clays um, method of estimating um, the composition of a volcanic rock, which is also just not great for using with uh, volcanic uh, lava flows. And I showed you also this, um, the alkalized versus silica plot to use the, the whole rock chemistry of the rock to give the rock a name. This isn't going to um, be a way to name the, the, the materials that are coming out of um, an explosive eruption and to name the pyroclastic material. Um, it's just not an appropriate way to classify it. Instead, we use the size of the materials, these airfall fragments, and we're going to use the name ash to describe any individual particle that comes out of an explosive eruption that's less than two millimeters in diameter. Lapilli are two to 20, 64 millimeters, and bombs and blocks are both larger than 64 millimeters. And the only difference is whether the material was erupted when it was solid, such as the blocks, so that they won't look deformed during the eruption, or whether they were partially molten when they were erupted, and then they're called blocks, or bombs, excuse me. 
Now, if we've got a rock, a pyroclastic rock, that is comprised of many different kinds of pyroclastic ejecta, so ash, lapilli, bombs, or blocks, then we can, um, and, and that it's, when it's deposited, it becomes lithified, and uh, a rock, I'll, I'll repeat myself, a rock comprised of those materials that we just classified by size, then we come to these diagrams. And we're going to start with, with this diagram here, which is describing how you name a tuff, and a tuff is simply a rock that is um, comprised of dominantly ash size material, lapilli size material, box, blocks and bombs. If it's, and probably most commonly, you're going to be dealing with um, tufts or materials that are on this end of the diagram. But, you know, if it's 100% um, if it's 100% ash, a rock comprised of 100% ash, then it's going to plot on that corner of the diagram, and it's certainly a tough. Um, but most rocks aren't comprised of 100% of anything, and so there's going to be some component of larger material, maybe some lapilli, some uh, pieces of blocks and bombs, and in that case you use the percentage um, somewhere between 100% ash, 100% blocks and bombs, and 100% lapilli, to name it. So if you had a rock that was, didn't have any blocks and bombs, but let's say it had 60% um, ash, put a dividing line of 50% there, 60% ash, we have 10, 20, 30, 40, oh, I didn't do that very well, let me try that again, 50% ash, 10, 20, 30, 40, something like that, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Then 60 percent ash would plot somewhere here, and at that, and then it would be 40 percent um, lapilli. So you'd have a composition about here on the diagram, and we would call it a lapilli tuff. If the rock was anywhere between 70 and 100 percent ash sized particles, then we would move over to this diagram, so that would be the second diagram you'd use if it's a tuff, and then you'd look at the particles that are in the, the, the tuff. Are they small pieces of rock fragments? Are they crystals? Are they glass? That's in addition to the ash. So if you see small piece, small crystals, little hornblende crystals, little quartz crystals, or maybe some pieces of um, lapilli that are a rock fragment, you're going to use the diagram in the same way um, and to name it, whether it's 100% glass fragments, 100% rock fragments, or 100% crystal fragments that are within the ash, and divide it up and name it um, a lith lithic tuff if it's dominated by... Um, small pieces of pumice, or if it's dominated by little hornblende crystals, then it's going to be a crystal tuff. So we'll look at these in class. So just a reminder, you start with the right-hand side. If it's a tuff, you move to the second diagram to name what kind of tuff do you have. Now. I showed you a picture of uh, Pina Tubo with the ash cloud um, erupting into the atmosphere. But I also wanted to point out some materials that come out of these pyroclastic flows. So these are these hot, fast, um, ground-hugging avalanches of volcanic material, including these ejecta, with the larger pieces falling out of the pyroclastic cloud as it goes downhill, but it's going, because it's moving so quickly, it's going to bring a lot of materials with it. Deposits that are, um, that derive from um, those kinds of uh, eruptions are uh, differ in, uh, in some ways. So we'll see some of this when we go to the Long Valley Caldera and look at the Bishop Tuff. And the Long Valley Caldera is located in Eastern California near Mammoth. And there was a, a large eruption that covered uh, an area that looks like this. The ash and pyroclastic 
materials covered a huge area, almost as big as the Yellowstone, um, the Yellowstone ash when it erupted. Um, that's this larger area here. Um, and now the pyroclastic material is going to fall closer to the caldera, but the ash is smaller particles, so that will spread to a much larger region um, and thinning as it goes, so the less material tra is traveling the farthest. Here's an image of the Owens River Gorge, ignimbrite, and an ignimbrite, remember, is a rock that is um, derived from a pyroclastic flow. So this is going to include ash, um, lapilli, and even blocks and bombs near to the center of the, the eruption. But this entire gorge is a pile of ignimbrite. It's really impressive. And something that you will see when we walk down the gorge is that the rocks change as we go down. So if we consider, this is the, the height of the pile of rocks in the gorge, 140 meters of ignimbrite. It's a huge pile. And look at this diagram that shows the density of those rocks increasing as we go down, well, it changes as we go down the gorge. But you'll see that the density starts out relatively low, increases, increases with depth and then it decreases again and increases with depth. What we're seeing is that the material that's denser deeper down has been compacted because of the weight of the overlying material and we'll actually see that the, we can feel that the density of the rocks changes just by picking up a sample as we go down and you'll see also that at the bottom of the pile of rocks it becomes welded um, so the glassy matrix um, is compressed, and you'll see the fiami of um, compressed uh, pumice lapilli. So here is an example of um, a cross-section through um, a pyroclastic flow, an ignimbrite, and ashfall. And what you see is that you've got the pyroclastic flow material here on the bottom of the pile. Those are the larger size particles represented by the larger pieces of rock in the diagram. And you'll see that the ash fall is um, at the top of the pile. That's basically what we're going to see in Owens River Gorge um, with the smaller particles um, ending up on the top of the pile with the larger um, pyroclastic ejecta um, falling out sooner. So it just it deposited sooner because they're um, larger materials and they can't be carried as far. Um, this is another picture of the Bishop Tuff in a, a roadside outcrop. But you see it's a large pile of mostly ash sized material in this case. And I just wanted to show you some up close pictures of um, what a tuff looks like. So these are small ash sized fragments in, that are dominating the rock with smaller pieces of what looks like lithic fragments and perhaps maybe in, in this image up here is better to see small crystals of individual minerals that are also in the tuff. So it's a tuff that's comprised of both um, lithics and uh, crystals. So on that diagram we had glass, lithics, um, crystals to classify the tuff. And I would say this one, well, it's mostly ash, but uh, the lithics seem to dominate. So I think it's probably going to fall somewhere in this um, part of the field here. And we would call it a lithic tuff. So we need to be more specific than just tough. We need to name what kind of tough it is and to be more specific.